Hi, everyone. My name is Nancy Matkusau. I use she, her, hers, and I am representing the Cross Cultural Center. Welcome to today's Equity Talks for staff by staff. I'm pleased to have our presenter today, Dr. Diane Forbes Berthoud of the Vice Chancellor Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And today's talk is called Black Women in Leadership. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone. Diane Forbes Berthoud, she, her, hers, and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, as Nancy said. And a little background about me. This is actually my area of research from before I came to UC San Diego from my time at Howard University, HU, and very much focused on women in leadership and specifically um, race, gender, class, and other intersections as it relates to our life. We often say that research is autobiographical in some ways, right? So the people who care about issues related to matriarchal societies are very much studying their mothers, if you will, or those who might be thinking about sleep disorders or mental health or high functioning persons in the medical field. Like my uncle had studied something similar. He was an orthopedic surgeon struggling with two or three major mental illnesses and one of the highest functioning uh, surgeons for the Denver Broncos back in the day. And so I remember a talk he gave and he did give these talks at the Thanksgiving table. My daughter might have been one, and I'm thinking, Uncle Teddy, please. But he said, you know, we're talking about a family member who had cancer, and he said, you know, and one thing that they don't talk about is mental health. And all the children were like, what is he saying? And then he talked about his challenges with mental health, but how he was able to navigate his life as a Black physician. He was the first Black medical student at Tufts University in Massachusetts. And he openly talked about that at a time when our family wasn't talking about those kinds of issues. And so his research and his work related to that as it pertained to medical practice was autobiographical. And I was in graduate school at the time thinking, yeah, so this study of mine on black women leadership was not only about me, but my ancestors, my mother and the figures that I had seen. Welcome to our talk today and our time together. I will get set up and I actually do have something to share with you before we continue. Welcome to those who are coming in. Good to see you. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, this is part of my um, own research and areas that I care about. How I'd like to approach today is a conversation as well as sharing some of the research and giving you opportunities to talk with each other in breakout rooms. Because I'm sure for an hour, although I am amazingly dynamic and interesting, you don't want to hear me for an hour. I think it's also instructive and very helpful for you to be able to talk with each other. So I'm gonna set a video up now and then ask for your reactions to that and your feedback. If you can hear, give a thumbs up. Okay.
I'm back. Thoughts, feelings, reactions. I'd love to share that that video gives me chills. It isn't the first time I've seen it, but every time it gives me absolute chills. Uh, the other thing, just candidly for me, I feel like the women are here and what's coming is people are talking about it mm. because I was, one of the reasons this gives me chills is it exposes my ignorance around the level of leadership and women in areas across the world. Yes. Um, and obviously I'm more familiar with what's happening in the US, but there has been um, so much happening that mm -hmm. I appreciate in that video. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I've seen it at least six times and same, I was almost close to tears just now. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. Um, Lindsay Hunter. Hello. Uh Hi. Uh, one of one of the things that um, I I've noticed and and what I I, I do love about the, uh, the video is uh, the diversity of uh, the kinds of women that are, are represented by uh, the different groups and how after living in South Africa how normalized it was to see women in like all of the the high positions they were everywhere mm. whereas what uh we we tend to see more in the states um is not as not as high although we <laughs> we're um, we're getting we're getting there uh, wow vice president but uh the, the other thing that i i wanted to uh just uh make a quick comment on was uh the countries that have uh, so um, many uh, women in their higher positions. When we saw the the white women, I I've noticed there's fewer women of color in um, the other positions us running there. So there's there's not that um, same uh, groundswell of women supporting women that are and in, that's intersectional and they're ready to also uh, assume that position mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. of, of higher powers and I'm 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 waiting I'm waiting for that day when uh, we do see that liberation for all so mm -hmm. thank you so much Lindsay. very excited other... chills chills same 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 other comments or reflections when I see it um, it makes me proud to be a female and I just think of becoming you know here in America, you're seeing more and more women in prestigious positions, and we're becoming. Mm -hmm. We're not backing that. down. They might as well get ready because we're not going away. We're multiplying. We're becoming. Mm. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much. A few more voices. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Nicola. I really Nicola. love that video. Um, and I definitely think when um, what that video needs to be shown to everyone, because I think with the media, you don't see it as much as you should. Um, and I'm grateful for Women Her Story Month because then you see more images in the media. And I think um, young women really need to see it. I think when I, when I see a video like that, it gives me permission to go beyond. Mm -hmm. hey, I'm not limited in my position or, or, or circumstances and I can push to go beyond. And um, I do think when it comes to the, the US that it's, it's, it's time and definitely not wanting to lose the momentum of, of what's happening in, in the world and being able to even push forward. So I love it that it gives me that permission is to just move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. So the framework, and I shared it with Nancy and Edwina shortly before you all came in the room, for me, which is important as an immigrant as well, is locating who we are and, and preparing it as a black woman, speaking about black women in leadership in a global context and also connecting it to allyship. That many of these women, Kamala Harris included, Oprah and others didn't arrive there by themselves. That they were supported, sponsored, helped, 
pushed in some cases, invited in other cases, not only by women and not only by black people or black women, they were invited by colleagues who looked like some of the premiers, some of the prime ministers and presidents that you saw there. So to me, one from the global slash immigrant perspective, as well as understanding race as situated within a larger community and helping us because the world is changing. And you talk about the women are coming and we're already here as Natalie said, the world is changing. That change already happened. And some of us are just catching up to some of that. And so I remember 35 plus years ago being in school and hearing more about globalization. And I remember not many people in the 1980s, and I grew up in, in Jamaica, not many people at that time anywhere in the world was really talking in a mainstream way, so to speak, about globalization. But in our school at that time, our principal who had spoken three, four languages and had traveled throughout the US and the world got this bug. And people actually thought she was a little loony. Like, what is she talking? Like, people, that's, is that even in the dictionary? And she was preparing us in that girl's school to play on the world stage by learning the other languages, by learning not just Western history, but learning about the Middle East. And I remember reading many African books and reading about Aboriginal peoples in Australia and Southeast Asia and all these kinds of things as a 13, 14, 15, 16 year old. I can count probably on one hand the number of Amer American authors I read. It was it's like a smattering all throughout the globe of at least five to 10 authors and books from each part of the world. And I look back now and I go, oh, I'm so grateful that she did that. And so I wanted to situate that with this video as well. So let's continue. And then you're going to go in breakout rooms in a while. So get ready for that. And what we will do is uh, we'll just watch the video. We had that conversation. What I'd like you to do in your breakout rooms, you'll be with at least two other people. So the breakout rooms will have three persons. Cat's in the waiting room. I'll just admit her. What I'd like you to do, as I mentioned about supports, mentors, ancestors, and this is so much a part of not only Black experiences and identities, but it is also a part of what it means to be woman in some cases, that collectivist, that whole that brings us to this moment. So I'd like to ask you now, before we go into that room, to think about your inspiration and your role models. I mean, you're here for a reason today. And so something propels you or brings you or invites you here. Who is it who makes it possible for you to be here? Who is it? And it doesn't have to be one person, right? And who is your role model professionally and personally? If you're speaking from the perspective as a black woman, we have other guests as well. So um, whatever your positionality is, I'd like you to take about 10 minutes as a trio. So no more than three will be in a group. So each person will do maybe two to three minutes with discussion and talk about your own role models, living or departed, your ancestors for your professional life as a woman, black woman in leadership or as a person and inspiration. Okay, so clear on what's going to happen. So just discussion about who makes it possible for you to be here and who inspires you. And as you think about your leadership journey, this person is, is going to go with you in that way. So you are going to now go in breakout rooms of three. Okay, awesome. So you should see an invitation on your screen shortly and you have about 10 minutes. Good luck and I might pop into a few. See you soon. Oh, it's Nancy. Hey. Hello. Yeah, we were just chatting about leadership and women can be more male centric in their leadership. I will say that the lady in New Zealand though, and the lady in Iceland that I knew about their COVID stuff, they oh, just I mean, they're making better decisions. They're amazing. So, I mean, I definitely think, I mean, so Nancy, I was saying sometimes it's like this weird dynamic, like around like values versus identity and like sort of how do those interplay? Like there's forgetting her name, but the woman from Georgia, like the QAnon woman, right? She's a oh. woman. What's her name? From Taylor Green or something. What's her But my point is she is a woman, but she is a horrible yes. leader. You know, right. I mean, yeah, I think it is green. Thing. Yeah, like Marjorie Taylor Green. Is that yeah, her? something mm -hmm. like that? Something like that. But anyways, so I guess this weird interplay between clearly someone could identify whether it be as a woman or as black or as whatever and still carry out policies and practices that are against the interests impressive of yeah group. yeah you know that are actively hostile and at the same time i do think that there is something to thinking about the ways one's experiences around gender in this case like impact their leadership and the ways that they might lead differently so um 
yeah so i always i always like think that's interesting because just because somebody is a woman doesn't necessarily mean they are going to carry out policies that are going to benefit women yes. or progressive or pro gender equity or pro social justice whatever you know so it's just yeah it's it's hard to sort of talk about the both and right representation matters and representation obviously has to also come with values that are going to put you know those issues at the forefront in a way that is progressive was green the one who would put the sign up trust the science when somebody had put up the rainbow yes. flag yes. Okay. Yes. she put her colleague is trans and put up or has yes. a trans child or something okay. but put up yeah just a really there are two sexes, like, trust the science yeah like right. like that kind of stuff so yes that person is a woman i think that's always the challenge i mean i struggle with this i think a lot in women's center work because quite frankly i think there are a lot of women white women in particular like a lot of women who actually hold for other really hold patriarchy and whiteness pretty close values. to the vest it's not right sometimes i think it's that struggle of how do you sort of name that identity is important while also realizing that just because one carries an identity doesn't mean that they are going to do work that is progressive or benefits people of that identity. <laughs> so we might need something for women. Um, in the Black community, the folks say people are skin folk, not kin folk. Just because you're skin folk, you might not be <laughs> yeah, kin folk. Yeah, I think that's, and, that's the same kind of idea, right? So it's how do you sort of be, yeah. And how do we talk about, talk about identity and gender and how it matters or race or other identities and then, but also name that, yeah. I'm funny. I always leave the meeting when I don't mean to. Oh no. I hope I don't do that. <laughs> I came back though. We're all back. Ooh, I had a oh, moment no. there. It's like, did you lose the people? <laughs> no, because sometimes you can leave the meeting and you're like, yes. hey, so I left the meeting accidentally. And I'm like, I, oh, I, that's what I did. Yeah. So they I have think, about maybe 30 seconds. Yeah, and hopefully they're finishing. No, I if think they're that, oh. Yep. Oh yay. Yeah. I love technology. Welcome back. God. Welcome back. I thought I had closed the whole thing. So I was like, oh my gosh, what just happened? <laughs> Thank you for saving me, staff, Cross Cultural Center team and Women's Center team. Welcome back, welcome back. Wasn't that amazing? I eavesdropped on like three different conversations. I'm just <laughs> imposing my own view, listen to me. Wasn't that amazing, everyone? All right, so a few voices to tell me what happened in your rooms, whether I got to pop in or not. How was it? What did you learn or hear? Well, in our group, I'll go. Thank <laughs> you. First of all, we were glad that we were all together because I think it was like three different age groups, but we realized that, you know, you don't just learn from the older, you're, uh, you're learning from younger also, and that saying it takes a village is really true. And then I share with them that even in such a time as a pandemic, how bad it is, that it's been good for me because I, I wouldn't have been on a lot of Zoom calls. I've been in a lot of meetings with the people that I've been in over this past 12 months. Thank you. So there's a, there's an upside somewhere in there, right? There is a comment in the chat from oh. Natalie. Natalie says it was great. We talked about the oh, role of mother. Yeah. That is not singular. All right, well, let's continue. I could share. Mm -hmm. I could share that Julie and Vanessa, they seem to be more motivated within. They have a fire within themselves rather than pointing to a person in their life and really following the, the, the works of Stacey Abrams and being inspired by all the good things she's been doing uh, really inspired Julie. And, and Vanessa and I had uh, something in common that we really want to open the, open the limits, take off the limits and open up boundaries for our own daughters. Mm. Seemed to be a commonality that, that we, our children, we want the most for them and we don't want any limits and, and just, encourage them so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you that's what we yeah. shared thank you I, def I definitely connect to that my first child is a is, is a daughter maya and I, some of you have heard me talk about her before thank you for that reflection and then lindsay and then we'll move on thank you what i i just wanted uh, to share um, very briefly is that unfortunately i haven't had a lot of uh, personal heroes in terms of people that women that i've i've known in the academic environment that i grew up in was extraordinarily competitive <laughs> with with women and so I, I didn't have a lot of role models here but since I've come uh, to uh, UC San Diego about uh, a year ago I <laughs> so many role models now I can't list them all and I'm sure that all of all of you will you'll be there uh, as well it feels 
so good to be supported at uh, UCSD and to, to have a, a campus that really takes care of uh, employees and the students and, and everyone. And, and each individual person, I think, embodies those, those kinds of values. I have a crush on this campus. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Lindsay. And go Tritons. I, many persons on this call or some persons can exceed my years. It's been almost 11 years for me. I know Edwina, it's been 20 plus, right? And there may be others. And Jim has had a 40 plus association with UC San Diego, among others, Millicent and others. So I don't know everybody's years of service. So I, I know that people have stayed in part because of that great support. Thank you all for sharing so far. Let's continue. We just talked about inspiration role models. I've mentioned some of the things that have inspired me. We shared the video, you had your conversations. As we talk, let's continue to think about, and I'll share with you some of what the research shows us about the competing and intersecting challenges and opportunities that Black women in leadership face, including what Collins years ago called like the double bind or you know, a, a double trouble, if you will. Beyond the 1990s into the 2000s and now, we are talking more than just about race and gender. We are thinking about ability and veteran status, sexual orientation, nationality, um, age, which Millicent and some others talked about here. And when you think about what Black women in leadership are managing, it is all of the above. It is the denigration and the psychosocial elements related to how people understand and classify and then respond and create and co-create race in the United States or the world, which often is connected to a legacy of colonialism. It's connected to a legacy of slavery. It is connected to a, a legacy of bondage. And so in our bodies, in our blood, in our professional and psycho, um, psychosocial and our cognitive development are those elements of oppression. And you have components of gender. I'm just taking black women as, as some ways to think about it. In some similar ways, our components of uh, sexist oppression, our components of uh, placement in society. And over the years in the research and in our social discourse, we've heard a woman's place. In fact, I'll extend that. In some parts of my parents and grandparents rearing, it was a woman's place is, can you finish that? in the home, in some places, in some cultures, among us, we have said those things, right? Not we as in you and I necessarily, but as a system in the US and the world, um, domesticity is one of the things with which the, the female gender has been um, associated. Now, since that time till now, there are so many other elements around gender identity and expression and identities and expression, I should say. So many elements around how those intersections weave into black women's experience. And so it is more complicated than the 1950s, 60s, 2000s and 2010s and now we're into 2020. I raise all of those things and I cannot mention them all because there are more than those. And I raise all of those because these are the kinds of things that I encourage us to think about when we think about women in leadership, black women in leadership, and sometimes they appear to be competing intersections and there are times that there are opportunities there. So it is because I'm putting this out there because in, in some of the research on women in leadership and not only that, the premiers and prime ministers, there's some beginning work around the countries that have female heads are faring much better because of the, including um, Slovenia, Serbia, some of the countries that you saw here, right? And some of the African nations, for example, they're faring better. And some initial thinking, it's not complete at all because we're still in the moment, is that in some ways, there is a level of compassion, care, understanding, empathy, holistic thinking, integrative thinking that um, we are able to do. I'm not saying it's a definite thing and I'm not saying it's for sure that's the case, but I just introduced some of those ideas and studies to say, while we might say, yes, there's racist, sexist, homophobic and other oppressions that black women deal with as leaders, there are also opportunities. And so the strengths that you and I have and the perspectives that you and I have from our ancestors from the role models and inspirations that we just named are the ones that I would like us to call upon. I certainly do in my own journey as we move forward. So it's yes and, it's both and, and therefore we can. 
and I think about it as all together if, if you want to think about it in those ways. I, I planned another breakout, but we're such a wonderfully interactive group that if I send you off again, we may never come back because you, you'll go, I know I will. So this will be a whole 25 minute discussion, but I will open this up for us as we're all here. And if you could just say your name before you begin, so we can begin to get our names in the room. I know we just have a short time together. I'd like you to think about, and I'm happy to start with this part of the narrative. What success have you had in leadership development and advancement? You can just take a picture of this because I'm gonna take it down so we can be all together. What success have you had in leadership development and advancement, if, if any? And what conditions facilitated that development? So think about success that you've had and then what were the conditions? Like what made that happen to bring about that development? It doesn't necessarily mean changing your position. It could be learning something new. It could be advancement in your role. It could be moving from UC San Diego, from somewhere else to UC San Diego or moving within UC San Diego or expansion of your portfolio. So anything that looks like change or development and what conditions facilitated that development. And I'll get into some of the research around uh, what we know is needed for sure. Okay, so I'm gonna stop share. Just take a picture of this, stop share so we can have a broader conversation. We won't do a breakout for this one. I don't want to lose any more time. Let's hear from you. Successes you've had, things that you know worked. Andra. Um, I talked about this a little bit in my breakout room, but I was able to participate in the UC Women's Initiative. And that was partially women in leadership across campus like Edwina and Diane who vouched for me, um, you know, have you ever seen the, the crabs in a barrel picture? It's like, once you get to the top, you have to reach back down and help folks uh, climb up the ladder. And so I've had women in leadership who've helped to pull me along. But we also discussed in my group, um, imposter syndrome. And I've always used imposter syndrome as a checkpoint with myself to say, not do I deserve to be here, but oh, this means I'm, in a, I'm pushing myself. This means I'm, I'm in a space where traditionally I don't belong, but I'm gonna go ahead and decide that I belong. And so I feel like the successes that I've had uh, within leadership or within professional development have been times where I've decided this description technically doesn't describe me, but I'm just going to go ahead and put myself here. I'm going to go ahead and grab a seat at this table. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Lindsay put uh, Audre Lorde's essay quote from 1980. Certainly there are real differences between us of age, race, and sex, but it is not those differences between us that are separating us. It is rather our refusal to recognize those differences and to examine the distortions which result from our misnaming them and their effects on our human behavior and expectations. So sometimes it is limiting um, to think in only particular terms. Um, and sometimes part of the limitation is on us. I hear Andrew saying, I'm, I'm going to be bold and courageous even though I don't think this is a space for me and push forward. But that has come with some help from Edwina, help from me and others to get you to the UCWIO. Thank you for that. And it was my pleasure. Um, others, successes you've had, what facilitated that? So let's encourage each other and affirm each other. Well, I don't wanna always be the one that's speaking, but everybody's so quiet, sorry. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, first of all, Andrea, I, I applaud you because I know how you feel that we have to pull ourselves up. Uh, Sometimes we have to be the one to take that first step. Uh, you know, there's mentorships and there's there's different mentors that we can go to or people that we admire and we just want to sit at the table with them, you know, to glean some of their experience and just talk to them, to be encouraged by them. And oftentimes I found myself on this campus in the past 29 years having to uh, pull my own bootstraps up to fight for myself, to, to not give up, not turn away, you know, positions we can apply for, but do we always get them? No, there's always something behind whether well, the other person had this or whatever, when we know and feel, we feel qualified for those positions, but we have to kind of go out on a limb and speak up for ourselves and fight for ourselves. And I'm learning through this past year, well, I've known over years, but you know, if we don't stand up and speak up and fight for ourselves, we'll get pulled in the mud and overlook and count it out. And it's fair and it's time for it to stop. Thank you, Millicent. Thank you for sharing. Edwina? I really appreciate this conversation. And um, some of what I'm, the phraseology I'm gonna lose is ableist language and we need better language. But I do remember being able to have the people that I would go to and I'd be, is this really happening? What, do, who can I mirror from? 
And it was women that I would go to and we'd go have coffee and I'd be like, I don't understand what's going on. I just need to be real and raw. And those spaces where we let people be that way and know that they're affirmed, I think are really important. So I need better phraseology of that. I, that's what we used to, we would go into meetings and be like, you please tell me I, I'm not, I haven't lost it. Like I'm, I'm, I, there's a different way to look at this because often as the only person of color or, or the only woman in a room, you don't get those cues back around what's happening. And most often people are like, no, you're reading that correctly. And here was what we can do politically about that. So, so I really mm. appreciate having those moments with people to check in on my own perception and worldview about something that was going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Lindsay, then we're gonna move on. Okay. Millicent, I totally, I totally feel you on the, like, well, I don't wanna talk too much. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, quickly, once, once again, my, my internet's unstable. Here's my face. As a white woman and, and an American, I, I think that we, we get super, you develop this kind of sort of overpowering dominant personality to be able to uh, come to the table in what is very often a, a more masculine dominated environment is that you pick up some of the worst types of aspects of being gendered as as a man where they're told that they must be you know very macho and loud and, and dominant and so th which of course they don't have to be but those are the things that then um we tend to pick up. And so living in South Africa, one of uh, the best things, what I think is my favorite thing that I learned was the not being the spigot for my help. It was the finding the people within the community that want, that were already doing such an amazing job and elevating them. So people would come to me, not for my help, but for the person in their community or in one of the communities that was surrounding them. And my, my favorite, the thing that I think was, that made me cry a lot was when we had a community that was marginalized for being very dangerous and, and, you know, and gang oriented and was always in the news. And uh, we had, we had a wonderful project uh, team that was, that had been working there, uh, local people from the community. And they had a beautiful garden that, uh, that they had uh, done. And we, we helped transport them. The help that we gave them was we helped move them into other communities that, that needed help with uh, that gardening and including into communities that were much more privileged, but to teach people how to do it yourself. And so we were able to work together and I mostly just stood back and would ferry people <laughs> around and to watch uh, Raji Boda, uh, the young man who was in, in charge of that program and who piloted it and who his desire was to turn, you know, the narrative on its head. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you. So capacity <laughs> building and centering the voices of the community. That's great. All right. So let's talk about what I think we all have experienced and some more of what the research shared. And you'll probably he hear some of yourself in this because the research is about us. One of the things that black women in leadership experience is what's called the visibility invisibility conundrum. So we are seen and appreciated at particular times and in particular contexts. And sometimes that happens we end up being seen when there is a problem, <laughs> when there is an issue, and when we are raising, some of you mentioned that when we are raising the concerns that affect the conditions of our lives or people who, for whom we're advocating, people who look like us or causes. As we have seen in the United States and in other parts of the world, Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, the voting suppression issues that we have in the US, the list goes on. Some of what we're seeing in Myanmar now and other places, women of color and black women in particular have been at the forefront. And I'm mentioning the US, but of course there are other contexts where we have been seen because of our leadership, because we are bringing attention to crises. And we're also saying this isn't right. In some cases, we're the subject of the trouble. And so there's, there's that component of the visibility. Where the visibility, part of the visibility conundrum is also because we are one of the few in the room. 
So when Edwina is saying what she's saying, she's like, when you're the only woman, only person of color, I've had that experience, not only at UC San Diego, but my other work in the United States before coming to California. And so everything that we do say, how we act, how we dress, the hair, the comments, the intonation, the tone, the eyebrows, the frown, everything then becomes hyper visible because we are the only and we are representational of every black person, of every woman that's out there, of every black leader that's out there. And that pressure is psychologically a burden. The folks who write about RBF, racial battle fatigue, talk about this in general for persons of color and black people, but I am using it in the sense here now to talk about black women's experiences. Now, the other part of that conundrum is the invisibility part, which is in so many other cases, we are not seen sometimes in the data. We are not seen when it's time to talk about the nuance, the essence, the complexity and the depth of our experiences in part because of numer lack of numerical representation and of course, in part because of gender and sexist oppression as well as other intersecting oppression. So, so this conundrum then is exactly as it says, it's this push pull, it's both and, and we're holding both in our corpus, if you will, our professional, personal, psychological, cognitive, intellectual bodies, and it's a burden. Networks are also very important. However, most often according to the research, men and white persons are not necessarily as willing to make informal and formal networks as readily available to women and specifically not just women of color, but black women, because we can be seen sometimes as economic, professional and personal liabilities. And so if you were already in the group last year that raised, let's say hell, if you wanna put it that way in the colloquial terms, around the issues of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others in the workplace, it's going to be more challenging for someone to think about uh, investing political, social, cultural capital, in part because of fear, lack of courage, also in part because of professional and psychological will that they may not have, right, or ability. And so it's like, oh, I don't want to touch that. She's a troublemaker. I don't want to touch that because of whatever. So we are sometimes not a part of these informal networks. Hey, you want to go play golf? Hey, you want to come have a drink? Of course, this is pre-COVID. But think about those ways in which business gets done in higher education, in politics, in the corporate world. And so these are two aspects of our lives that are a part of leadership. And I would like us, as I mentioned before, to think about the assets and the strengths that we bring to our roles. And sometimes, how do we know this? We call on each other in an honest question and answer time to say, not just, am I seeing this right? But can you, like, really, do you talk to people about who you are, who you trust, that is? What do you see here? Could I, how could I run that in another way, that meeting in another way? Do you have any feedback for me on how I should phrase this proposal or the title that I might use here? Any kinds of readings, you know, so really putting out there to someone who you trust, some of the mentors, ancestors, persons you named, who might be able to reflect to you that your being outspoken is a strength in this way. And here's how it might be used in this setting. That your being the first to speak can be considered a strength or your being the first to write that email can be considered a strength in these ways. Now, of course, you have your own reflection. So the intrapersonal dynamic, the intrapsychic dynamics are alive. And we also are social beings. So the intrapersonal, maybe a one-on-one -on -one with a mentor sponsor, the group, you, you, I may have circles of people, whoever those people are, right? Family members, sister friends, uh, other coworkers, other mentors, other people who are two steps in their profession that you might, might want to know more from or about. I have a group from high school. I went to a girls' school, mostly girls of color. And we are on a group chat right now. I'm sure they're texting me the minute I'm talking, this moment I'm talking to you, you know? And there are about six or seven of them. Uh, one or two are in medicine. Another one or two are in banking. There's one, two of them are international. One is an engineer. I'm, I'm the only one in higher ed, which is kind of good because sometimes you need to hear a corporate perspective. Sometimes I need to hear a medical perspective. Other times I need to hear from someone who is, is a statistician, right? The one who works at, at the bank, the international bank. And so I call on them and others, but I'm just mentioning that group as a network that's outside of my higher education network that reflects Diane, you know you're really good at giving a speech or you know you're really good at this. Why don't you try that? At NASA, here's what we do. And I'm like, thank you. And they're all bosses. They think I'm one too, but they are like bosses at NASA and Mayo Clinic and all these amazing places. And so I draw on them for that. And I, I mentioned that to you. Oh, something got cut off. 
So let's talk about some of the key ingredients, which connects to what you just mentioned about the conditions that have helped you. What are the, the areas of success? This is both in the research and also in my life experience that I know works. A supportive and affirmative culture and climate organizationally is essential for Black women's leadership. This can be also extended to other groups, right? But just speaking of the intersection, um, intersection of oppressions as well as opportunities, I offer this as, and I'm happy to hear, you know, UC San Diego has been supportive for many. It has been for me in some areas, although not perfect, right? Edwina, and we're not telling tales out of school or whatever. It's both end at our campus. And I've, this is my fifth academic institution in 25 years. There is no perfection. I've been at Howard, I was at Trinity, I was at University of Maryland, I was at George Mason University, now I'm at University of California, and my daughter's going to Howard, so I'm going to get another view, 25 years coming out, of what it's like now. I'm sure I'll see things there. There is no perfection. And from my other colleagues I just mentioned in science, engineering, and banking, and so forth, you know, th there is none there either. When I talk to them, they have issues at the hospital too, as well as at the International Bank. So know that there are aspects of support and affirmation in every culture, as well as aspects of dysfunction and unsupportiveness in every culture too. Can we help each other find where those pockets and areas are at UC San Diego or wherever we're, we're heading or whatever we're thinking about doing? That, what does that look like, right? It looks like some of the things that I mentioned. You can call on people, so the collaboration, you see that in the word cloud here, welcoming. In the middle, you see mentorship, transparency, positive attitudes, again, not every single Triton is going to have this, but it's in our system. And on this call, there are persons here that you and I know we can call upon or they can lead us to someone to whom we can call or on whom we can call. So trust and kindness, I, I know almost everyone on this call and I know that any of you have those attributes and qualities. So that's what an affirmative culture climate looks like. The other thing is mentorship and sponsorship. And the reason this is a multiracial, multi-ethnic, uh, multiple age slide is think through your past, think through where you've come from, things you've done, things you've seen. I can go back to my time at Howard and Washington DC, my mentor, one of my mentors from Yale, um, African-American male who passed away at 45, it's African-American male. Then I can think of Zachary Green, African-American male gay married with two sons. Uh, his husband, same, right? Dutch, white, male, gay uh, from the Netherlands, but lives in the United States. Another mentor of mine, someone from whom I've learned, Jim Lin. Jim Lin gave me one of my first major opportunities on this campus with the Experiential Learning Conference. That's how I got to meet many other people on this campus. And I, my name and my profile to some degree were elevating. People were like, who is that person doing this thing? Can you help me over here in urban studies and planning? Can I work with you and collaborate with you on that? And by the time I came to this role, I was able to say, Wayne. I was able to say, Teddy. I was able to say, Fauna. I could call on different people because I developed these relationships from Sixth College and could advance that, this agenda here. Yvonne Evans, Angela Song, many other people that I got to work with in this role. And so I'm naming men with Ann Briggs Addo, Mae Brown, Barbara Sari. So again, women, men, different ages, different orientations, people from different countries, as I said, um, Renee is from, from the Netherlands, you know, and people on this call who are community members. So think about the variation and the diversity of the kinds of mentors and sponsors upon whom you might call. Right? And I'll keep moving because I want to uh, consider our time. Through these mentors and sponsors, we can acquire new learning, we can be socialized in different ways about not just UC San Diego, but, but about higher education, about whatever process you're learning in your ear. Maybe you're in health sciences and there's a particular way to do something in, in the School of Medicine. There are some times, and I learned this from Anne, I learned this from May, from Barbara and many others on this campus, some, who, some of whom aren't here anymore or retired, different cues and different ways to think about political processes and context. These are not always available to Black women, particularly in the US context because of the networks and the, the levels and extension of oppression that I've talked about. And so this is even more critical for us. Culturally, Black girls are socialized to speak up and speak out. That's how I socialize my elites. That's what she has become. And I'm like, well, that's strength. Loyola offered her $80,000. Howard offered her $75,000. 
both merit-based, but they're both called like presidential leadership scholarships. And I'm like, oh, well, who knew? Teaching a black girl to speak up and speak out could bring, I didn't was doing that to get $85,000, but they read her profile and went, wow, from the age of eight, nine, you've been in student council. You've done this with the presidents of these organizations. You've been to the World Bank. You've done all these different things with these amazing people. There must be something here. And I see it as an affirmation. Of course, the current moment we're in culturally, where as one of my colleagues said, black people seem to be trending is how my psychologist friend in, in, at Wharton said. And I was like, Flora, you're funny. And so, you know, there's some elements here that are, are not cool, if you will, for black women to do. And a mentor can speak to both the prejudice and bias in the system as well as in order to understand this dynamic. Here's some things you might think about. Okay, moving on. Another thing is, and I know there is a political and psychological implication, many implications here, stretch assignments. What they call it in the research, stretch assignments. Be willing to take stretch assignments. And those are things that are perhaps above and beyond what you're currently doing, or it might be something a little bit outside of your scope. You know, so it hurts me a little bit when I hear us, women, uh, persons of color, black people, that's not in my job description. I'm not gonna do that. That's not something I'm supposed to do. Just imagine if we turn that a little bit to think about the opportunity, and I understand the elements. I have two children myself, a family of four, sustaining a family outside of this country. I have a lot of balls in the air. And I think about what's the learning opportunity here? Who could I meet? What could I learn? What are the ways in which I might help to advance not only the institution, but myself by doing this? What is the learning here around higher education administration? Perhaps it's something about finance. Perhaps it's something around conflict resolution that I might learn budgeting. And so sometimes we're called in a room because of the confidence in us and, and we might limit ourselves or we might embrace something new and grow. So think about stretch assignments that might provide opportunities, bringing it to a close because of the possibilities, the new learning and the new tools and strategies. So culture of climate, mentorship, willingness to take stretch assignments, preparation. If you have a moment, read about or watch any video about the life of Melody Hobson. So she's on the board of Starbucks and she is the CEO. I wanna say venture capital company based in Chicago, I believe. I forget the name of the company right now, but just look her up. Melody Hobson, African-American woman, she is married to the Star Wars guy, George, forgot his last name too. So she's all over like CNN, CNBC, she's written books and she gives these interviews. And one of the things she says is, it doesn't mean you have to adopt it, but it, it resonated with me. She's like, I, I understand imposter syndrome, but she said when she was younger, she's probably 50, 51 now, but when she was younger in her twenties and she got into the venture capital world, she said, you can, you can out talk me, you can out you know, run me, you can do all these different things but you will not be able to outperform me or you won't be able to outwork me. And what she was saying was when she got these big files for the financial stuff, she would read it all. And people had to stop, look and listen because she was able to show her level of preparation, but also almost able to, to talk them out of the room as in she knew the facts, the figures, she was able to speak to the data specifically, ask the kinds of critical questions that would shift the discussion. And so, you know, reading those reports, when you're about to talk with someone, Googling that person, watching the videos, being up on all the symposia where they've spoken or the newest thing that's out, you may not know every single thing, but develop that breadth of knowledge of what's happening in our world and that level of preparation, moving it on. Courage and resilience, I could spend a lot of time on that, emotional intelligence, agility, and the importance of relationships. I probably could start with relationships, relationships, relationships at the very top, because this is very much a part of helping us as Black women leaders, as women leaders, as leaders to think about our networks and who can vouch for us and what can people say about us as we're moving through. Agility is so important. We have to shift and move now with not only the remote environment, but a new set of skills, how we relate to each other in the virtual environment, how we respond to issues related to race, racism, discrimination, anti-racism, which is what we're not only talking a lot about now, but responding to. Am I able to listen, learn, um, and take new information for the purposes of our own growth and change? And emotional intelligence is our ability to navigate complex environments, solve problems, and respond to the social cues, respond to psychological cues, and others. I could say much more about that. I'm just giving you the, the wrap. Now, this is the final thing here. 
all of this right here is about self-care, self-renewal, rejuvenation. These are just some examples, things that I do. I, I run, I work out and I almost, especially in COVID, I almost never miss a day. Even if it's to lift some weights, do some stretching, even if it's to walk around my house and say, oh, oh, I did 15 minutes, something where I start feeling warm, dancing, whatever it is, I just have the stretching picture there. Maybe you are someone who reads and journals as this person is doing here socializing with others however we can. So rejuvenating with community. If you have a spiritual practice, and so as a person of faith myself, this is a part of my spiritual practice to be silent, to listen, to read, to call on a spirit outside of myself. For me, that is God. You know, these elements of the spiritual, psychological, social, the intrapersonal where I'm with no one but me, I'm like, yay, introverts. You know, um, I spend that time to reflect, to read, to, to go in. And I read a lot, both online and the hardcover books. My daughter, who's a reader, says, the online thing, mom, I just don't know, which is so unusual for a young person. She says, I like, I like to open the new book and she sniffs it. And I say, I don't think that's weird. I think that's amazing. It's not my thing, but okay, great. So the like new car smell for her, a new book smell is amazing because of all the things about the stuff that she's reading. So think about your renewal practice. It has to be disciplined and consistent or you are going to be eaten alive. This is my experience moving through leadership and thinking about you know, the future, thinking retiring in the next 10 to 12 years or so. I'm like, how am I gonna round out the game, right? Do I want to round it out frazzled? Do I want to round it out where my heart has given way, where you know I can't sleep at night and my body is all over in terms of rhythms and everything else? How do I wanna do that? And what are the areas where I might have some control? So think about your own practices, spiritual, physical, um, intellectual, Thank you. And thank you for hanging in there. I know we went a little bit over time. There's so much more we could talk about.